the objective for Arrival Live is to um, educate the students on consequences for driving distracted or driving while intoxicated. The first day of the event is, it starts out as normal class day for everybody. And we go into the classroom, we have a set uh, script that we read. Wayne High School is participating in a program titled Arrive Alive. Uh, tells you the statistics of drunk driving and texting and stuff like that. And then we go into the fact that we're, you know, the student just passed away, that the Grim Reaper has just touched. And then we go into their obituary. Paige Colleen Wilson, born August 31st, 2001, died May 3rd, 2018. Place the obituary on the chair. We put a rose down, represent that uh, that student has passed away, tape it down, and nobody's supposed to sit in that chair for the rest of the day. But after we pull them out of class, we go to a room where they we have uh, moulage artists come in and they make them up as a ghost. Our group goes out with their obituary boards that were read in their class and they stand out there for the student body to stop and read. The reason we do this, the mock craft scene, is to show them how lives, their lives can change within an instant. Um, from life to death, that's how quick it'd be. It's a snap of a finger, blink of an eye. Again, at the end of the day for this program, we really want to impact them to keep them safe, keep them alive, and go on and make fabulous lives for themselves and for their families. Thanks for coming to our second portion of our Arrive Alive program. Uh, the Arrive Alive program challenges high school students to think about the dangers of driving while under the influence of alcohol, drugs, or by texting and driving distracted, and the responsibilities of making mature decisions. This program shows that just one bad decision to drive under the influence are distracted, cannot only have a tragic results that affect their lives, but how it affects the community around you. We're gonna show you a presentation of what led up to yesterday's scene that you saw out on the track. I did. 
Did you text Amber and ask if she was almost there? Yeah. Tell her we're almost there. Yeah, right. she'll be waiting outside when we get there. driving, operating, or controlling a motor vehicle in violation of Minnesota's DWI laws, and you have been placed under arrest for this offense. I want my mom. All right, come in here, why don't you go stand on the feet for me, okay? cat scan right away. Looks like there's an open skull fracture. We see what could be some brain exposed. It's really difficult to say right now. What do you mean it's not good? Is she alive? We did a cat scan that did show that she's broken the second cervical vertebrae. 99 plus percent of people that have this type of injury do not recover. It's very likely she will not move her arms and legs again. But I think it's very likely she'll be paralyzed from the neck down. And so it's possible that she will need a ventilator to assist her with breathing forever. 
blood coming through her ears too, so it's probably there. a vasculitis yeah. fracture. Well, it looks like well, we got some well, 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 well. Do we have a blood pressure at all with this? Go ahead and start Just chest compressions. Ready? Let me know when you need to be clear. Clear. All right, go. Shock. I think it's probably time for us to call this. Uh, this is a non-survival injury. We have Mark Insurance. It's Abby's friend. I sure have. It doesn't sound like anyone in the vehicle was wearing a seatbelt, so there's some question about whether someone was distracted or intoxicated that was driving. Shortly after she got here, she went into an arrhythmia of the heart uh, on the chance of survival or zero. And unfortunately, she did die shortly after she got here. I'm very sorry for your loss tonight. I know this is not where you were hoping to be at the end. This time, I'd like to invite um, family members up to read their impact statements regarding the, their family member. We was, they were asked to write a letter the day I died. Um, so I'll invite the first family up. Will the Jones family please come up? I hope everybody heard that. <laughs> Wow, who, who wants to follow that video? Oh my gosh. Dear Abby, today you died. And our hearts ache to have our daughter back, even for a few moments. We'd like to tell you again how proud we are of you, how your smile and laugh lights up our world, and how your death will leave a hole in our lives forever. We are hoping this is only a dream and we will eventually wake up from the nightmare. A parent should never have to lose a child. But here we are, grieving the loss of our only daughter. Losing you is like a living hell on earth. While we try to piece together why God would let this happen to you, to us, to your friends, to your brother. And to those of you you haven't even met yet, never again will we, be, will we be able to hear you sing at the top of your lungs, watch you play lacrosse or hockey, hear you enter the house with a thud and a bang like Kramer from Seinfeld, watch you wildly dance in the kitchen after requesting everybody watch you, listen to you laugh at your own jokes, watch you take endless selfies, see you smile, see you secretly laugh while your dad is trying to discipline you <laughs> and experience you being your goofy self. As parents, we all dream of our children's future. Today you died, and all those dreams we had for you are forever gone and forever left as dreams. While your friends are graduating from high school, having grad parties, leaving for college, playing college sports, graduating from college, starting jobs, getting married, buying a house, and having babies. We'll only be left to dream about what your life might have been. We're sure your life would have been amazing. Unfortunately, we will go through the rest of our lives without you in it. Abby, did you know you were loved? Did we say, I love you enough? <laughs> Did we hug you enough? Did we tell you how proud we are of you enough? Were you in pain while you were dying? Did you think about us, your family, and your friends during those last living moments? Those are all questions we won't know the answers to. But we can only hope that as you were breathing your last breath, you felt a sense of peace, happiness, and love from your mom, dad, brother, family, and friends. Today you died, and the space you will leave in our hearts is enormous. And we don't know if we'll ever recover from this grief. What we do know is that we were blessed to have you in our lives for 17 years. 
We are eternally grateful for the honor of knowing you and the pleasure of raising and loving you. We love you immensely and will miss you every day for the rest of our lives. Well, I should start this off by telling you both that I love you so much, and I mean it. You never know when someone's last day could be, so you always have to take the opportunity to tell them you love them. But for me, I feel like it was just habit. You leave the house and you tell your parents you love them. If you're about to hang up the phone, you tell your parents you love them. I never really thought about it. It's just what I did. Mom and Dad, I will miss the unconditional love from both of you. The endless hugs, kisses, and the series of the same five questions you ask just to show you care. I'll miss mom excitedly coming in my room and telling me she had a surprise for me. It was always just a hug, and sometimes I'd get disappointed, but I would kill for a mom hug right about now. I'll miss all of the daddy-daughter dates to get lunch or ice cream. It's moments like those that you take for granted. I'll miss always trying to explain high school things to mom and trying to keep her hip on the slang. She recently tried calling me boo and making up her own words, telling me that someone at work was hilarious or that someone was cray-cray. I'll miss laughing uncontrollably when she would use something in the wrong context. I'll miss dad's jokes and funny stories that would have anyone laughing until their stomach hurt. And I will miss my big brother Carter. We'd recently got a lot closer and I'll miss the heart-to-heart -heart conversations with him in the times we'd just sit there and laugh about our parents and tell each other funny stories. I know I haven't thanked you enough, so thank you for everything. I truly appreciate it. Thank you for always being my number one fans and supporting me in everything I do. Seeing you guys in the stands at my games would warm my heart. I know neither of you would miss a game for the world and would do anything and everything in your power to be there and make an effort to cheer me on. And I can promise you, it doesn't go unnoticed. I was constantly looking into the stands to make sure you were both there. And sometimes I even watched close enough to see if you were drinking a Diet Coke or eating Skittles. Thank you for all the sacrifices you've made for me as well. I'm sure there are a billion other things you'd rather have done with your free time than always watching sports or doing something that benefits me. Thank you for investing so much time and money, whether it was training so I could be the best athlete I could possibly be, something you'd slip into my room, or a family vacation for us all. You are truly two of the most selfless people I know, always thinking about others first. Thank you for always letting me have my friends over only to destroy the house that you just cleaned earlier that day and to eat all the food you just bought from the grocery store. I'll miss all of our jokes, signature looks, late night Taco Bell runs. Today I died and I never got to tell you how joyful you've made my life. I'll miss hearing all of the advice on college and just life in general. I wouldn't have been where I was without you both. You've had the largest impact on my life and you showed me how to make the best out of all situations. Not to sweat the small stuff because in the long run, none of the little things matter anyways. You just have to accept it and move on. Mom and Dad, I want you both to know that I have died happy, full of love and joy. Thank you for teaching me to enjoy every second of my short life. And to my friends, as a young, vulnerable high school student, it is completely normal to feel invincible, like you'll live forever. Even being an older human feels so alien that you don't even consider it. Your own mortality gets pushed aside as if it doesn't apply to you. But you never know how long you'll be here, because there are a number of things that could happen, and your time could be cut short. So we can't take anything for granted. You don't want to be the one who cuts somebody else's time short by making a poor decision. There are many things I won't be able to experience because someone made a choice to drive drunk. But I especially want to thank Gabby Rosenthal for being my best friend since seventh grade. Thank you for being a part of my family, having dinners with us, and always getting the You Are Special Today plate from my dad because you're truly something special, G. Thank you for always being there for me and pushing me to be the best person and athlete I could be. Always telling me I can do one more rep, more weight, or just knowing I could do better than I was. Thank you for always being such a positive influence on me and being so trustworthy and reliable. I could count on you for anything. You're such a strong and amazing woman, and I was lucky enough to be able to call you my best friend. I know you'll be, oh, I know you'll accomplish so much in life, and I'm devastated I won't be able to experience it with you. Thank you for all the laughs and tears, and ultimately, for keeping me sane. I couldn't wait for college with you. It was the coolest thing when people would ask where we're going to college, then to ask how far Ohio State and Kent State were away from each other. I would just tell everyone, it's about two hours, but if you ever overheard me, you'd come into the conversation and say, actually, it's one hour and 50 minutes. To tell me later, it sounds way cooler to say one hour and 50 minutes. 
I'll miss the times we'd laugh and tell we'd pee, and the times we'd play music and make up new dance moves in my kitchen. I remember one time we were watching my neighbor's bonfire from the front window, trying to be secretive, only for G to receive a text from somebody that said, I can see you watching us from Abby's front window. We were already half tired, which automatically, automatically makes everything more funny. We thought it was the funniest, funniest thing ever, and we were rolling around my, on my kitchen floor dying because they caught us watching them. We were so embarrassed, and I don't think I've ever laughed so hard. Definitely top 10. And if you know Gabby, she may have tried to tell you that she doesn't have a laugh, but I can reassure you that she does. You just have to get lucky enough to hear it. I also want to thank the rest of my friends as well. Rachel, Deanna, Steffi, Ava, Bella, and some newfound friends. You know who you are. Thank you for being the best and just understanding me. I'm so proud of each and every one of you and know you will move on to do great things in life. And Bella with her secret billion dollar invention. This is for you, my best friends, the people I can tell everything and relate to like no other. I don't think you know what that meant to me. Today I died and this is me saying goodbye. I'd like to call the Thompson family. Good morning. You died today, and we never got to say goodbye. We don't get to give you one last hug or see a smile flash across your face as you say love you guys and clomp out the door in your hiking boots coffee cup in hand. You died today and there will never be another tomorrow with you in our lives. While we are thankful for all the times that were, we cannot help but think about all the times that will never be. No more birthdays, no more holidays, hunting and fishing trips, no more binge watching our favorite TV shows, no more quiet talks in the garden while we sunburn and complain about weeds that seem endless. Tomorrow, instead of seeing you dressed in your new suit, playfully rolling your eyes as we clamor for one last picture with your prom date, a stranger will dress you in that suit and lay your body in a casket for your funeral service. You died today, and we are in disbelief such a tragedy could strike the same family twice. It was a very short five years ago, two officers notified us that your Aunt Leah had died at the hands of a drunk driver. We feel like we are just settling into a new normal we cannot imagine how we will overcome and come to terms with this new tragedy. We keep telling ourselves this cannot be real and desperately hope at any moment we will awaken and realize this has been a terrible, horrible nightmare. However, deep down, we know the end of this nightmare will never ever come. You died today, and the world has lost a champion of con conservation and wildlife. We are so happy to know you had found passion early in life. There was immeasurable potential inside of you, waiting to be shared with the world. It is fitting the name we chose for our firstborn son means rest and comfort. And, for eight, and 18 years later, your chosen career was to become a conservation officer where you could help protect the great outdoors and the wildlife living inside it, ensuring its preservation for future generations where so many go to find rest and comfort. Our faith teaches us that while the body dies, 
the soul lives on forever. We are not fond of goodbyes. We much prefer until we see each other again. We love you, Noah. The day I died, I forgot to tell you I loved you, but those three little words couldn't describe what all of you meant to me. To my mom and dad, there aren't enough words to tell you how much the two of you mean to me, but I'll try my hardest. Mom, even before I was born, I was a pain in the butt. But you didn't give up, and you never have. You've, you always have advice. And when I mess up, you're always there to pick me up, give me a hug, and tell me I shouldn't give up and try harder. And I told you so. To my father, you are my parent, my mentor, and my friend. You taught me how to be a gentleman. You taught me wrong from right. You were always there, even though you had too, too many other things that just needed to be done. You both have taught me more than I could ever learn in any school. You've stood with me when no one else did, and even when you shouldn't have. You've stood by me when you were at your breaking point, and yet you found the strength to be a rock for me. You invested your whole lives into me, and there's no way I could ever repay you what you have given me. And I know what you'd say. You say it was your job as a parent, responsibility, but you've gone above and beyond for me. You've gone to hell and back for me too many times to count. I couldn't have asked for better parents, mentors, friends. I love you guys so much, and I will miss you. To my two younger brothers, I want to say I love you guys so, so much. And I want to say I'm sorry. I'm sorry I couldn't see you graduate high school and college to see you guys become amazing gentlemen. I'm sorry I won't be around to see you guys married or congratulate you when you have your first child. But most of all, I'm sorry for leaving you too when you need me. Because the pain for me only lasted a second, but for you, it will last your whole lives. And even though I teased you, was hard on you, or when I smacked you just because you were being dumb, or when I was just a jerk to you guys, I want you to know I love you both more than you will ever know. And I hope that one day you will be able to forgive me. I know these words won't heal the hole I've created in your heart, but know that I love you more than anything. Grandma, you were there from day one to my last. I wish I spent more time with you, stayed over just one more time, call you just once more, just so I could hear your voice, to say hi, ask you how you were, what were you doing? Just talk about life and to let you know that I loved you more and to hear you chuckle and hear you tell me that you loved me more and that you always would. I want you to know I'm so sorry and that I love you. To my amazing girlfriend, I want you to know I'm sorry I left you like this. I'm sorry we couldn't create the future we wanted. I'm sorry we couldn't take the trip you wanted this summer. It hurts me more than you'll ever know. That I won't ever be able to see your beautiful face or hear your laugh or feel the comfort of holding your hand. I'd give anything just to hold you in my arms for five more minutes and tell you that I love you. To my best friend, you have been a brother from another mother. I won't forget the times where we just sat and ranted about anything that came into our heads. Or the days where we just went out and did whatever we wanted. You aren't just my best friend. You are part of my family. You are my brother. I'm sorry it had to end like this. Thank you, man, for being there, always. Whether by text, a meme, a call. And, when you, and you stood by me, even if it was just the two of us against everyone else. I'll never be able to repay what you have given me. To all the other teachers and friends over the years, thank you. You've shaped who I, have, who I am today. You've stuck by me when things got hard, and you taught, when you taught me a lesson or gave me a helping hand when I really needed it. Thank you so much for the time and energy you put into me. I'm sorry I threw that all away. A mother and a father who loved me 
two amazing brothers who will always be missing their older brother, a grandmother who I adore, amazing, beautiful girlfriend, a best friend to kill for, and more friends and teachers than I could ever count, all because of a single poor decision. And as a wise man one told, once told me, actions have consequences. Thank you, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jones and Abby, Mr. and Mrs. Thompson and Noah, for those letters that um, are insightful, um, emotional, and deep. Um, continuing with our program, um, I'd like to call up uh, Blaine Police Chief Brian Padani, who will give us some words of wisdom. Thank you, Officer Nanny, and thank you all for having me today. The, uh, a lot of people don't know, you know, Blaine, we're the largest community here in Anoka County, and Anoka County is the second deadliest county in the state of Minnesota, and no, we're not the second biggest. The, uh, that's certainly not a title that we want to have here. The, The law enforcement community here is doing a lot of things to try to combat this and try to curb this. I'm going to give you some statistics from the city of Blaine on some of the, some of the citation numbers that we see and how those have climbed the last few years, particularly as they pertain to the Arrive Alive program. For our texting and driving citations, in 2016 we had 46. In 2017, that went up almost 700% to 309. And in the first quarter of 2018, we are already at 317. Well on our way to eclipsing a more than doubling or tripling the percentage that we've had in past years. We have another statute called failure to drive with due care, basically another form of distracted driving. Those numbers were at 35 in 2016, 52 in 2017, and are already at 14, excuse me, 14 in 2018. Our DWIs in 2016, we had 47. 2017, 125. And 2018, we're already at 55 in the first four months of the year. Our seatbelt violations, continue to climb as well. 2016, 179, 2017, 222, and already 56 this year. In response to some of the problems we've had in our community, we started a traffic unit back in June of 2017, uh, consisting of two full-time officers doing targeted enforcement with some of these problems. And in those first six months that they worked, we had 256 documented traffic complaints and established 26 enforcement zones, including the enforcement zones out in front of the school that we're, into, uh, that we're in today. The officers worked over 732 hours, conducted 1,600 traffic stops, and issued 880 citations. We have multiple school enforcement zones that we've been working, and Already we've written over 3,000, or close to 3,000 citations just on those two officers alone in less than a year that that unit has been in place. In the future, we're going to continue to work with our other members of our community, including um, doing things like displaying traffic safety messages on some of our billboards, 
um, implementing and deploying additional traffic monitoring equipment. Uh, continue with school enforcement zone enforcement, excuse me, with school zone enforcement, assisting with the school patrol, patrol program and presenting point of impact materials to driver's education programs in Blaine, consisting of a classroom presentation to students and a presentation at parents' night. Statistics are important, but the impact for me is in personal stories. As a, as a police officer, you never forget your certain firsts that you have. I'll never forget the first fatal crash that I had, especially as I look out at all the young people here. As a new officer, shortly out of field training, I was dispatched to a crash of a rollover. It was that night, well, 11 or 12 o'clock at night. This was 20 years ago. I haven't forgot it to this day. I got there and there was a car that had rolled over, it was driving way too fast. Two 16-year-old kids from Coon Rapids had rolled the car. It was the first car on the scene. One of the kids had been ejected approximately 200 feet from the vehicle. The car was on its roof in somebody's front yard. I ran over to the car. I could see there was another kid inside the vehicle. And the vehicle was basically crushed, but I could still get inside one of the windows on the car. So I crawled inside that window as the vehicle was on that roof. And this young man, a 16-year-old kid, was basically stuck in the vehicle. And his head was wedged in between the seat to a point that I was younger and stronger, but I still could not pull that seat apart to get him out of there. So I held his hand and I talked to him. He squeezed my hand. And I kept talking to him, telling him to hold on. As I talked to him for a couple of minutes, his grip got weaker and weaker, and he died in my hands. At that point, I got out of the car. I went to the other kid, another officer from a neighboring agency had arrived at this point. We did CPR on this 16-year-old kid. We lost him two times. The helicopter came. We lost him for the third time after we had brought him back. Lost him in the helicopter and couldn't bring him back again. That night, I went with the medical examiner to go do death notifications. One of the worst things we have to do as police officers. As luck would have it, both of these 16-year-old kids as parents were separated or divorced, and we had to do death notifications to four sets of parents that night. I spent almost six hours talking to parents, explaining to them that their child would never be home again. That was 20 years ago, but you don't forget that. It's so permanent. And to know that it was so preventable. Both of these young men had been drinking that night, and they became a statistic. My words for you all is don't become a statistic. You have a choice. You have a gift. Do your part with that gift, and don't waste it. Thank you.
Thank you, Chief. I appreciate those words. Um, it is true that first responders do deal with a lot of this issue every day. And as you can tell, we get emotional about it, just as you guys would. So we're, just, we're here again. We're wanting, wanting you guys to make great choices. And that's what this is about, choices. So what we want to talk, move to towards now is when you make these choices, what other consequences may happen if the ultimate doesn't happen of a fatality in your life? I'd like to have the Nooka County Attorney, Tony Palumbo, come up and speak to that. Thank you. Good, good morning. Can we hear? Can you hear me? Okay, we're good. Hi. Now you get the legal aspect. My name is Tony Palumbo. I'm the Anoka County Attorney. And in Minnesota, the county attorney is a combination of your county counsel and the district attorney. So I'm the chief prosecutor here in Anoka County. I have an office of 43 other lawyers, uh, 13 of whom are devoted to the juvenile division. What we have seen here today is very, very close, of course, to the real thing. You know, distracted driving, drunk driving is a circumstance, as you can see, very easy to fall into. And you don't realize it, but what's going on outside your car when you're driving drunk or driving distracted? You know, first, you're putting between one and two tons of metal down the road with other tons of metal. Just think about that, putting that on the road. Or you're putting that on the road with human beings that are crossing your path. Let's do the physics, shall we? At 60 miles an hour, and, and you physics majors and math majors can do it all for you. At 60 miles an hour, how fast are you going? 88 feet a second. At 45 miles an hour, 66 feet a second. And even at 30 miles an hour, you're at 44 feet a second. So in football terms, if you're doing 60 miles an hour, you're making three first downs in one second. By the time I finished that sentence, you've already traveled 88 feet. Think about that. And when you're distracted, even for a second, you've launched tons of metal down a road with absolutely no one controlling that metal for at least three first downs, so to speak, in one second. And if you do that and you injure someone, the law says you can be criminally responsible. You know, your parents, nobody's going to get you out of that. If you drink and drive and you hurt or you kill somebody, you're a licensed driver, you're the person that's going to be taken to jail. And if there's an accident, the possible charges are one, criminal vehicle homicide, or two, criminal vehicle operation with great bodily harm. The only difference between those two charges is if a uh, person who you injure dies or not. But if you cause severe injury, you're going to be charged as a crime just as much. And what is criminal vehicle operation? If you cause a death while operating a motor vehicle in what's called a grossly negligent manner or a negligent manner while under the influence of alcohol or drugs. You don't have to be drunk. All you have to do is have drugs or alcohol in your system. And if you are also negligent, you can be charged with a crime if you injure somebody. Or if you have a blood alcohol content of over 0.08, you are automatically impaired under the law. And even if you didn't do anything negligent, if you were just driving with 0.08 alcohol in your system and you hit or kill somebody, you can be charged. And what we always look for when we determine whether we're going to charge somebody with a crime in distracted driving, number one, were they distracted driving and other factors. Were they speeding? I remember charging someone who went through a 93rd and Central. They decided to pass a car coming to an intersection, and they decided to speed through the intersection. And they happened to T-bone a 70-year-old man and killed him right on the spot. He was charged because he, violated, he was also speeding and it was illegal to cross through, uh, pass through going through an intersection. It's a classic example. If you're too fast for existing conditions, if that road is pretty slippery out there and you're driving a lot faster than you should, that can be gross negligence. And of course, you have alcohol, drugs, or if you leave the scene of an accident, or if you have a defect in your car that you know you should be taking care of and that causes it. So we look for all of these factors when we're determining whether to issue charges. 
and all are a basis for issuing charges. And again, with criminal vehicle operation, we look at the same factors, and the only difference is whether someone was killed or not. So. And if you're under 18, you would be charged as a juvenile, but you can be certified to stand trial as an adult. And our office will try to certify you. If you remain in the juvenile system, you're most likely you will get what's called extended juvenile jurisdiction, which means uh, you get a juvenile sentence and an adult sentence until you're 21. You could spend time in a juvenile detention center out at Lyle, and if you violate, you would get an adult sentence after that. And of course, if you're certified to stand trial as an adult, you get the same process as an adult. Doesn't matter whether you're 14, 15, 16, or 17. If you are certified, if a judge determines that you have to stand trial as an adult, you go through the system just as if you were 18 and above. Okay. You get arraigned in a public court appearance, you need for an attorney, your bail is set, and you're booked into the jail just like adults. You get to wear that famous orange jumpsuit and you sit with the other adults in jail until your bail is posted. And of course, the jury trial is a public trial and it usually occurs anywhere from six to 12 months after that occurred. And if you are found guilty, there is a sentencing hearing. And I will tell you, I've sat through many sentencing hearings as law enforcement has also. And you know the worst part of a sentencing hearing for a defendant is hearing how your actions hurt so many other people. You have to sit there and you have to hear those victim impact statements. And if it's your friend that you have killed by your distracted or drunk driving, you have to hear how that family cries every day because they miss your friend. And you will get the same sentence as an adult, which first time, even with no criminal history, that's 41 to 57 months in prison for your first time offense. You'll either go to St. Cloud Prison or Shakopee if you're a, a female. And then of course, there's the lawsuit against you and your parents, then the other lawyers come about, right? Because there's gonna be a lawsuit to cover a lot of those expenses. So it's gonna be against you, and of course you're not gonna have any money, but it's gonna be against your parents also. Now hearing all of this, you have to ask yourself, is that drink or that text really worth it? You know, you are coming of age. You know, you're soon to be graduating from high school and you are gonna have to make choices in your life, where to go to school, whether you're going to military, whether you're gonna get married, whatever you're gonna do. You're gonna have choices and those are gonna be adult choices. And I think my message to you this morning is choose smart. You know, you can learn the easy way, you can learn the hard way. Learn the easy way. Choose smart for you, for your family, for your friends, for everybody else's family, and for your future. And after today, I really hope you know what that choice will be. Thank you. So now you've seen, you've talked, you've uh, listened to a couple of speakers. My last speaker has a more a personal attribute to this cause. I'd like to have her come up and tell her story about it. Please welcome Gina Calestro. I'm going to test technology first. Good to go. Perfect. Can everybody hear me okay? How about now? All right, I usually talk pretty loud and, and pretty fast, so I'll do my best this morning. Thank you to Officer Nanny, the Blaine High School, and the Arrive Alive program coordinators for the opportunity to be here today to share my personal story of tragedy and loss as a result of a drunk driver. Professionally, I present to thousands of physicians each year without a script. However, with this topic, I use notes to attempt to keep my emotions in check. A little about me, I'm a resident of Andover. However, my heart will always be in the city of Blaine. Professionally, I'm an employee of Medtronic for the past 22 years. I'm an avid volunteer for MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, the Toward Zero Death Initiative, and the Minnesota DWI Task Force. Personally, I'm a mom to an amazing six-year-old named Mikey named in honor of his late grandfather, Michael Calistro, 
who is why I do what I do to carry on my father's legacy of public service. I personally have family members and friends that have graduated or are currently attending Blaine High School. Maggie Weir, a fellow cop's daughter. I want to commend all of you, those on the field as well as those that were in the bleachers yesterday. The level of respect shown is testimony of the level of class here at Blaine High School. It's been nine years since I witnessed my parents crash. Yesterday was my second exposure to an actual arrival I've seen. I truly thought I was ready and prepared to see another mock crash without overwhelming emotions. I was wrong. In this instant, it was the same, in this instance, it was the same police department, the same ambulance company, the same airlink service. Victim, victim survivors, like the chief mentioned, emergency personnel truly never forget the scene. Let me tell you, what you witnessed yesterday was spot on to what happens at a real crash scene. The sheer panic, the four to five minutes that feel like forever before help arrives. Yesterday, the crash time was 1.27 p.m. The first squad on scene was 1.30 p.m. Felt like forever, didn't it? The questions that I asked myself, how can this be real? Why my parents? The incoming lifelink helicopter noise, that eerie sound of the rotor pitch brought me right back to nine years ago. No matter how much time passes, you never really get over it. I truly hope each and every one of you never has to be a part of a real scene. I don't wish that upon anybody. Check out my dad's mustache. The 70s call, they want their stash back. By show of hands, how many of you here have parents in law enforcement? I heard one earlier in conversations. How about extended family in law enforcement, by show of hands? That's a lot of hands. For those of you that do, you'll understand when I say growing up, there was a constant fear of getting in trouble. I hated that every time I told a white lie, my dad knew. He was trained to detect dishonesty. <laughs> I wasn't invited to many high school parties because my dad was my high school dare resource officer. That's right. Classmates assumed I might snitch all the party highlights to my dad. However, I was, still am, and always will be one proud cop's daughter. Nothing better than having your real life hero also be your dad. I believe that he could and would protect me and my sister from everything evil in this world. By show of hands, how many of you have had a loved one injured or killed by a drunk, drugged, or distracted driver? One hand is too many, absolutely. Up until April 12, 2009, I would have told you that I had led a happy, healthy, protected, and somewhat naive life. Easter Sunday, 2009, the day that changed my life. The day that my parents were struck by a drunk driver. A day that started out like any other holiday, food being prepared, family gathering all together, children giggling as they hunt for Easter eggs. When the day came to an end, my mother hugged me and said, Gina, this was the best Easter ever as they were preparing to return to their home in Coon Rapids. Little did I know that five minutes later, our lives would forever be changed. This was the last picture taken of my father that day, right after he finished hiding the eggs for the annual Easter egg hunt. My parents pulled out of my development at the time, right here in Blaine, onto northbound Lexington Avenue, followed by, by my sister and her two very young children in another vehicle. For those of you that were familiar with the area, the red dot marks the accident crash scene. Minutes later, the car my parents were driving was struck head on by a drunk driver traveling at 60 miles per hour southbound in the northbound lane. When I first looked at this picture, all I could think about is that it was truly a miracle. I did not lose both of my parents at the time of the crash. The photograph of the crash leaves many speechless. Notice how I didn't say accident. I try not to say accident because this doesn't happen by accident. It's intentional. The person in the white truck could be any one of you. If you choose to drink, I say choose because it's your choice and nobody's else. Once you take your first drink of alcohol, you're not making the decisions the alcohol is. I use this picture on my social media accounts on major holidays such as New Year's, St. Patty's Day, to serve as a reminder that every day drunk driving crashes take place, unfortunately way too often, especially because it's senseless and preventable. 
When the phone rang, all I could hear was the blaring sound of my mother's Toyota Avalon horn. It was a very distinct horn. I knew something bad had happened because my sister couldn't speak. I hung up the phone and headed the direction they would have taken home. At first glance, it appeared that my entire family had been involved in the collision as my sister's vehicle was pointing towards the cars to shine light on the scene. At that moment, I, the usually strong and decisive sister, fell to my knees on Lexington Avenue not knowing what to do. It was the most helpless, empty and alone feeling I have ever felt. My father was a recent retiree of the Minneapolis Police Department who planned to enjoy re retirement conducting grandpa daycare for my sister and enjoying the family like home. To quote a story of one of my father's police partners, the impact by definition is a statement of how I felt when I heard of the crash that ultimately cost Mike his life. While still trapped in his vehicle, what does Mike do? He tends to his wife by maintaining her open airway until help arrives. In the other hand, he grabs the phone and calls for a helicopter to transport her. He then orders the officers first on scene to remove the driver of the other vehicle and get him to the hospital for a blood alcohol test. He knew he was intoxicated. This is impact. Rather than going into self-survival mode, he went into Vietnam corpsman and policeman mode, others before self at the highest caliber. In society today, police officers are often seen as the bad guys. I find this ironic because they are the ones who are stopping the bad guys from endangering all of us. I have a different outlook on police officers. I see police officers as heroes. I did notice many high fives yesterday for Officer Nanny. You are all very lucky to have them in your school. The following agencies listed above I'm forever grateful for. They were there for my family the night of the crash, throughout the court process, and in fact they are still to this day checking in on us to make sure that we're all doing okay. The emergency efforts the night of the crash from Minoka County Sheriff, the Blaine PD, SBM Fire and Rescue and the State Patrol was instrumental in a positive outcome of my mother's survival in the criminal case as well as the civil case. From the officers and deputies that responded to the scene, the community service officers that closed off the roads, those that coordinated the helicopter landing in the parking of Walmart, the officers that ordered the accident reconstruction, the officers that took the driver of the other vehicle to Mercy, I knew that my parents were in good hands. You are all very lucky to live and go to school in a community with such a professional and compassionate group of law enforcement officers. These individuals are not bad guys, they are the good guys, trying to make this world a better place for us to live in. My parents were both critically injured. My mother was extricated from the vehicle and airlifted to HCMC with little hope of survival. And my father was transported by ambulance. My father told me on many occasions at the crash scene that he pleaded with God that night to take him and save my mother, his best friend of almost 50 years. 63 days later, his prayer was answered. They never saw each other conscious again. My mother, Carol Calistro, by the grace of a miracle, survived and has faced years of therapy around her injuries, but more painful was the heartbreak of losing my father. I am blessed because of my dad's actions the night of the crash, along with the actions of the Blaine Police Department and all emergency personnel, that my mother is still alive today, and she's a very proud grandma of three amazing kids. The life we had with my father was over, and an unwelcome new life without him has taken its place, a new normal, like someone mentioned earlier. My father was not able to walk me down the aisle on my wedding day with my mother and my sister. On holidays, now include a trip to the cemetery to send balloons to grandpa in heaven or decorate a Christmas tree in his honor. He was not there for the birth of my son. However, I do believe some days that his spirit lives on through my son, Mikey. What about the drunk driver? He was unharmed physically, but must now live forever with the fact that his bad decision to drink and drive took the life of a one-of-a-kind, larger-than-life man who meant the world to so many. This senseless and preventable violent crime left my mother a widow after 40 years of marriage to her high school sweetheart left three grandchildren without a grandfather, and my sister and I without a father, a man who we adored and often referred to as our best friend. In my mind, there was no amount of jail time or restitution that would ever measure up to the loss of my father. Justice was served when the drunk driver had to face his own children and tell them he stole someone's daddy. In fact, he may have been a good person, made good decisions until alcohol was involved. You see, you can't make good decisions when you drink alcohol. No matter how much you think you can, you can't. 
I hope and pray that he took the opportunity to change and make himself a better person, not just for his family, but also for himself. At that point, I could forgive him. In addition to the statistics on the back of this year's Arrival Live program t-shirt, which is wonderful, every day in the United States, 30 people are killed in car crashes that involve a drunk driver. That's one person every 50 minutes. In 2006, 100 Minnesotans died as a result of a drunk driver. In Minnesota, we had 23,392 DWI convic convictions. One in six Minnesota drivers has a DWI on their record. And you know what? The average offender has driven 70 to 80 times before they got caught. Let's talk about prom this coming weekend. Create fun memories, dance to your favorite song, Take lots of photos, and most importantly, be yourself. You don't have to drink to fit in, especially when you know the consequences now. My father can no longer make a difference in the lives of others. As for you, you are very much alive and are able to make your destiny, the destiny that you want. This is a very defining in your life because at this moment, you are able to choose a path in your life that you wish to follow. At this moment, you have the chance to help change the future by taking a stand against drinking and driving and texting and driving. You are able to define who you are and make that difference now. It's your time to be a leader and others will follow. It is a privilege to be alive and to be able to make a difference in the lives of others. You still have a chance to make a difference. If I could ask you to remember just one thing from the past two days, it would be to have fun without drinking. Be a leader and make it cool not to drink. You can do it, I know you can. And lastly, but most importantly, don't text and drive, don't drink and drive, or ride with someone who's been drinking. If you could feel only for a brief moment the extreme anguish and pain that I felt over my father's death every moment of every day, then you would understand what drinking can cost you and your family. Please think about it. Peer pressure can be hard, especially if you're the only one in the crowd who chooses not to engage in the behavior. Be that friend who says no. Like I said earlier, go a step farther and take a stand. Stand up for what's right and encourage your friends to stand with you and make good choices. I have a challenge for all of you. I mentioned earlier that on major drinking holidays I post the crash scene picture as well as my phone number and remind my friends and family to call me personally and I will come pick them up. I encourage those of you who are not going to prom or if you are but do not plan on making any poor decisions to post your phone number on social media sites. I completely understand it's hard to call your parents even if they assure you there will be no questions asked. So be that friend that makes that commitment to be available if possible. As many people know, Lauren Van Rees, a 2017 high school graduate, passed away Tuesday, March 6th, after the van with her and her family along with friends were riding in that was hit, it was hit by a drunk driver. The group was on vacation in Florida for spring break and had just spent the day at the Twins spring training opener game and were on their way back when the crash occurred. A moment of silence for Lauren, please. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share my story with you all today. Life is short. Have fun at prom this weekend. On the bright side, it shouldn't be canceled due to snow here in Minnesota, like the other high schools had. <laughs> Make it an enchanted starlight masquerade night to remember, not to forget. Thank you. Abby, do you remain seated for a few more minutes, if you mind? Um, a couple thank yous I want to put out here. Of course, uh, your classmates who are sitting up here, they've been working diligently for the last nine months, uh, getting ready for this. We've been uh, rehearsing, doing a lot of things to prepare. I just would love to have a round of applause for my group up here. I also want to thank all the speakers who have come up here, Chief Adani, Anoka County Attorney Tony Palumbo and Melissa, uh, Miss Gina Cholesterol. Thank you for their, your time. And <laughs> Lastly, I want to thank you guys for making the right choice this weekend. Okay? 
Hopefully see you all back here on Monday with pictures of fun, happiness, and who had the best prom dress. So we'll see all the uh, red carpet prom dress stuff, all right?